Hi everybody, this is Joe, and we are on chapter four of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Uh, this chapter is called Natural Selection. So in this chapter, Darwin, Darwin is going to flesh out his theory of natural selection, or what one of his colleagues actually calls uh, survival of the fittest, which by the sixth edition, uh, he has uh, subtitled this chapter. And I think actually he preferred survival of the fittest as a, a proper explanatory name for his particular theory. So uh, the way this book has been laid out so far is that the first three chapters have been just observations of the natural world, observations that Darwin has made in his own domestic life, in his own, let's call it, uh, laboratory, which is you know his rabbit hutch, his, uh, his pigeon hutch, his garden, things like that, uh, as a breeder. Observations what, which other naturalists have made, you know, his colleagues, about the varieties of life, even within the wilder world, uh, wider and wilder world. And then literature reviews, uh, you know, things that he has read from other naturalists in other parts of the world, naturalists of the past, things like that. First three chapters, the observations, really, I've broken down into four separate categories as I read it. I've, I've broken these, ca these, these observations that Darwin has made into four separate categories. The first, first category really is the malleability of life. Whether we're talking about domestic life or wildlife, it is malleable. It's undoubted that life is able to change based on its environment. And this is not a unique observation that Darwin made. As I said, evolution in a sense was understood in Darwin's day. And that's talking about the malleability of life, that life does change. And even variety within species, that is, uh, even within a species, depending on its environment, uh, it's something that I observed when I was a child. Uh, different flowers on cactus look different depending just on what side of the hill it's on. It's consistent that way. Uh, depending on the, on the elevation of a hill you're climbing, insects change color, for instance. So lots of these kinds of observations are made by Darwin. You know, uh, species, in other words, are not carbon copies of each other. They're not Xeroxed copies of each other. They're, they're not 3D printed or anything like that. There's variety, even within species. The question is, what explains this variety? What explains it? So far, what Darwin has been working with, or Darwin's generation has been working with, are things like... Uh, uh, alchemical type solutions, Lamarck solutions, transmutation of species, things like that. That's what they've been working on. And Darwin is, is not content with that because he says it doesn't, for instance, explain the symbiosis of different species with each other. How do they, you know, how do, for instance, bees, butterflies, and, uh, and flowering plants, how are they able to work off of each other? Transmutation does not answer this question. Lamarck doesn't answer this question. Things like that. You can't use a myth of a crocodile pulling on an elephant's nose to answer that question. It just doesn't work. There's got to be another explanation. So the next observation that Darwin comes up with, and I think this is kind of a, a, uh, a inferred observation, is that of um, the survival of the fittest within species. That is, it's not really obvious that um, chance is not involved when it comes to a lot of offspring um, and only one is surviving. So for instance, you know, the white example of that I used last time is of uh, frogs or toads laying a bazillion eggs only one of which may survive to be an adult. What determines what is going to be the, the egg that eventually survives to be an adult? What determines that? It's not obvious that it's not mere chance. It seems like it's just a luck of the draw. It seems like it's just, who the heck knows? That one just happens to have been laid. It got lucky. It won the lottery. And the key insight I think that Darwin made here is that no, it's not just chance. There is something about the egg. There's something about the, the, the embryo inside. There are traits about the tadpole. There are certain traits of that creature uh, 
before it becomes of breeding age that enable it to have a slight advantage over all of its brothers and sisters who may, you know, get eaten, who may burn up in the sun, who may drown, who may, you know, etc. I think that's the key insight, really, that, that Darwin is making that allows him to come up with the theory of natural selection, is that that one survivor, it's not just mere chance. The other observation I think that he makes is the inheritance of these advantageous traits and also real, the inheritance of traits that are not advantageous. So the inheritance of these traits is also observed by Darwin. So really you have these four key observations, malleability, variety, survival of the fittest, and inheritance. That's basically all you need. Those are the keys that Darwin has that he is able to piece together and come up with a theory of natural selection. And he lays it out really in the first chapter of this book. I'll just read it right here. So given these observations, he says, can it then be thought improbable seeing that variations useful to man have undoubtedly occurred, that other variations useful in some way to each being in the great and complex battle of life should occur in the course of many successive generations? If such do occur, can we doubt that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others, would have the best chance of surviving and of procreating their kind? On the other hand, we may feel sure that any, that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable individual differences and variations and the destruction of those which are injurious, I have called natural selection or the survival of the fittest. Very... Uh, well, he, and he goes on, but that is basically it. That's it. That's the theory of natural selection. That is, that is the theory in a scientific sense being the explanation given for the observations that he has made. The explanation, what, is, what explains the variety of life that we see on earth? What explains this variety? The answer, natural selection. The the pro it's a process. It is a sieve that sifts out the traits, inheritable traits that are not uh, that are injurious to the particular environment that this life is in. That's it. That's all it is. That is the one insight that Darwin had that nobody else outside of a few competitive colleagues that Darwin had. But outside of that, nobody before Darwin had come up with this. Uh, they, they were stuck with transmutation of species, things like that. This explanation is simple. It can be understood by a child uh, very easily. It's, it's there in half a paragraph. Um, it's not like Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, uh, the th his theory being an explanation or the explanation for what we observe about gravity. For instance, it's not like Maxwell's theories of electromagnetism, which explains what, you know, the observations we see about uh, magnetism, things like that. It, those are very complex physical uh, <laughs> theories with lots of ugly math involved. Uh, in fact, if you're lucky, I'll go over those books or papers or whatever uh, on this chapter someday. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> We're going to stick to stump something simple. Darwin is simple. Thing about Darwin, though, simple though this explanation, this you know variety or the uh, natural selection, simple though that it may be, the implications of this theory, the controversies surrounding this theory, are endless. Uh, this theory terrifies some people. Um, this theory has been used, misused, and abused by you know countless people, etc. Uh, hence the controversy. I mean, even though that it's so simple an explanation, why did it take so long? Why did it take uh, so long, even after all of these observations have been made? Why did it take so long for somebody like Darwin to finally put these pieces together and come up with this theory? Well, I mean, you've got 
you know, 2,000 years of Western thought saying that species are unique, special creations of God. Well, you know, that's a hindrance right there because with Darwin's, one of the implications of natural selection is that species are not unique, special creations. They're not unique. Now, notice one thing that it does not say. Uh, for instance, what, what, what does Darwin not talk about? What have not been mentioned by Darwin? Darwin has not mentioned the origin of life. He has not talked about how life starts. He doesn't say God didn't start life. In fact, he never mentions God. Um, he doesn't talk about the origins of life. That never pops up. It just talks about the varieties of life that we see. It doesn't talk about origins. The, the theory of natural selection doesn't talk about that moment of, of creation. How did that happen? We'll leave that for another day. That's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about the variety of how life changes. Uh, Darwin never talks about, has not yet talked about fossils. He hasn't talked about, you know, progenitors or ancestors of life as we presently observe it. That's not one of his observations. You, in other words, you don't need fossils to talk about natural selection. You don't need any knowledge of progenitors to come up with the theory of natural selection. You don't need to know anything about the origins of life. You don't need to know anything about genetics to talk about. I mean, Darwin certainly didn't know about genetics. He barely understood the laws of inheritance. He just made basic observations. I mean, the laws of inheritance are something that came up um, decades after Darwin. He, he didn't understand any of this stuff. He had four key, as, as I read it anyway, he had four key fundamental observations that have been made for many, many centuries, probably, by many other naturalists. He just was able to put the pieces together. Um, the, the only theories that, that were around, really, again, were transmutation, alchemical ideas of vestiges, um, things like that. And they all of that served as, as rabbit trails. People were, were still observing alchemical uh, properties of life uh, to explain the, the variety of life. And I think another obstacle was that the premise of the survival of the fittest versus chance of multiple offspring, I don't think is obvious. And that is one of the key observations that need that 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 Darwin made that I that you need to fit in this this theory of natural selection. That portion of it I don't think is necessarily obvious. And there's also also the premise of a young earth. So, you know, going off of Western religions, you know, you read Genesis, you read the Bible, sure looks like the earth is about uh, 6,000 years old or so, and we believe the Bible. So we're going off of that. Doesn't matter what the original authors had to say about the age of the earth. That doesn't matter. As we read it, it sure looks like the Bible says earth is 6,000 years old. And, you know, for centuries, we go off of that premise. That's the premise we work with. So there's not a heck of a lot of time for, you know, natural selection to work that process. But with, you know, with modern engineering projects and we're developing and, and industrializing the earth, we can't avoid seeing that, you know, geology and fossils, and these things are being discovered. The geology is saying that the earth is much older, you know, as we industrialize the, the countryside and we dig into the earth and we can see through the geology as we actually, you know, studying this thing. It's a, you know, Noah's flood doesn't explain what we observe in geology. And it sure looks like the earth is a whole lot older than we had previously assumed. So Darwin had more time to work with, let's say. It was understood that the earth was a lot older than a lot of his, you know, previous colleagues or previous naturalists uh, had thought. Now, a few things still trouble Darwin, uh, given his theory of natural selection. A few things trouble him. One of the things that he calls is, is correlative traits. That is that certain animals, particularly, you know, let's, let's just use frogs as an example. 
have various stages of life. So I talked about desert toads in my, in my previous discussion uh, that these toads will lay a bazillion eggs in one night and then they'll go back into the desert and lie dormant and wait for the next monsoon rain. And, you know, out of these bazillions of eggs that are laid, only one, perhaps, uh, one of these toads is going to survive to become an adult and pass on whatever traits it has uh, to, its, to its offspring. So the thing about a toad is that it has multiple stages. It has an egg, a larva, a tadpole, and finally a breeding adult. Those four stages any one of which may have a advantage, advantageous trait. So what say, what if, for instance, that shell has an advantageous trait? That one particular shell of the egg of that, of that toad is a little bit harder. And so it doesn't get eaten. Let's just say that that is the inheritable trait. Well, that hardening of the, of the egg shell may, for instance, have, have un intended consequences on traits of, let's say, the tadpole or the adult stage. Darwin doesn't quite know what to do with that. Uh, he understands that that may have, again, unintended consequences. And I think he's going to explore that in later chapters. Um, surprisingly, surprisingly, Darwin comes up in this chapter with sexual selection. That is part of natural selection. Sexual selection being that males and females of a particular species find um, each find traits in each other that are more attractive. So the those traits are then able to pass on uh, the, those those particular sexual related traits off to their offspring. So that's where we get things like, for instance, the wild plumage of a male of a particular bird, for instance. And we see that all over the place. Um, surprisingly, I had thought that that was a separate category, a separate theory uh, uh, of evolution. You know, in other words, natural selection is not the only thing. It is, it is a primary driver in uh, determining or explaining the variety of life that we have seen. Darwin came up with it, but that is not the only driver. It's not just the sieve of, of survival of the fittest in the sense of uh, offspring being destroyed or eaten by competitors or whatever. There's also the sexual selection being a form of it. That is males and females find advantageous traits in the opposite sex. And those advantageous traits will have those traits passed off uh, to offspring. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I use the example, just go to a singles bar and observe those sexual rituals take place right in front of you. Uh, you can see that humans do this also. By the way, that's one thing that Darwin doesn't mention in his observations is humans. Uh, he, he has not mentioned humans at all. He's left this strictly to all forms of life that he at least is able to observe all forms of life that he, um, his colleagues observe, things like that. But he never talks about humans, at least not yet. Uh, so uh, I think humans, in the sense of being just one species among many of animals, is to be inferred, at least thus far, because Darwin has kept away from that. It's kind of a white elephant at this point. So anyway, uh, or an elephant in the room. How does that expression go? Anyway. Uh, there you go. So that is the basics of chapter four. And uh, there you go. Natural selection, a theory which is dirt simple to understand and endless in its uh, serious implications about us as humans. Okay, that's it. And we'll talk to you later. Take care.